Ruler Long Reads, the finest long-form cycling features and stories from Ruler magazine. The Magnificent Seven, read by Hannah Braxton Brown and George Oliver. Ruler contributors guide us through their personal favourite editions of the Tour de France, ranging from 1948 right up to last year's amazing race. Download the Ruler app and the whole of issue 20.5 in which this feature is published is currently available for free. Use the code LETOUR, all one word. Ruler Long Reads is supported by Lacquer Bicycle Insurance. Lacquer is a team that looks out for each other. Their collective cover is made for cyclists for life on and off your bike. Lacquer has flipped out dated traditional insurance on its head. No more fixed up front premiums. Instead, your monthly contributions are based on the collective's claims that month. Your maximum monthly price is capped, but the savings are all yours. Plus 80% of your money goes straight back into the collective, fixing, replacing, helping, whatever. And the other 20% keeps their wheels spinning. It's as simple as that. And when things do go wrong, Lacquer's got your back. Claims are handled by experts and usually agreed within a day, with no depreciation or excess. Lacquer does not do annual contracts locking you in. With Lacquer, if you want to leave, you can, anytime. If you're new to Lacquer, you can get a £10 credit by signing up today. We all have our favourite Tour de France out of the 106 editions of this legendary race. For many... 1989's stunning turnaround by Greg LeMond of Laurent Fignon in the final stage on the Champs-Élysées remains one of the greatest moments in sporting history, let alone cycling's crowded canon. A mere eight seconds difference at the end of three weeks of racing. A truly epic battle. Others may cite Eddie Merckx's imperious performance in the 1974 edition, giving the cannonball his record equaling fifth tour victory with eight stage wins along the way. Some prefer to look back even further, to the great years of Coppi, Bartoli and Onkatil. Patriotism often plays a part in our collective memories too, with the previously fallow cycling minnows separated from the European racing heartland by the Channel, mining a rich seam since Bradley Wiggins broke the British duck in 2012. For Americans, surely Le Monde in 1986 is the standout moment that turned millions of US sport fans into bike racing supporters, and millions of proud Colombians will never forget a youthful Egan Bernal's victory just last year. We asked the Ruler writers for their personal highlights from La Grande Boucle. They range from 1948 right up to 2019. Races full of surprises, amazing feats and intriguing battles. 1976. Petit Tour. Olivier Nielsen Julien. Boulevard Houseman. 1976. While my mother was browsing bras in the gallery's Lafayette, I sneaked off to the sports department to gawk at a replica of Lucien Van Imper's bike. My hero finally had what he deserved. In the hottest July in living memory, he made it look so easy. Little did I know that Lucien's biggest obstacle to overcome had been his own director sportif, Cyril Guimard. As soon as the route was announced... Van Imper had his sights on stage 9 to the Alp. On the day, he put in a first acceleration before turn 21, a long way from the peak. When the group came back, he kicked again. Goodbye, Poulador. Au revoir, Tevene. Wheel sucker in eternity, Zotemelk stuck to his wheel like a leech and flicked him to the stage win. But Lucien had his first gel Lucien was over the moon. Cyril, furious. Gétain Campagnolo weren't meant to take yellow until stage 14 to salari Soulon. They didn't have the team to back it up. Lucien must dump the jersey ASAP. The Belgian disagreed. Cyril didn't care. After a look at the standings, he approached Peugeot's Raymond de Lille behind Lucien's back. If de Lille attacked on stage 12 to Pyrenees 2000, Gitan Campagnolo wouldn't chase. The Peugeot man gained one minute, two, and counting. Cyril still wouldn't let him chase. Zotemelk kept bugging Lucien. Why wasn't he reeling in de Lille? Lucien ignored the whining, swallowing his pride, but every cell in Lucien's body was bursting to hunt down de Lille. Giving away the jersey went against everything he was about. His people back in Café Van Impersport in Mare wouldn't understand. He was bringing the village into disrepute. The whole country. 
Cyril was fuming when he realised that Lucien had some of his Belgian mates pick up the pace. He pulled up next to Lucien twice during the final climb to slow him down. In the end, Lucien was 2.41 behind Delisle on GC. Zotamelk was closing in, six seconds down. Lucien put humiliation on the back burner and focused on regaining the lead in the Queen stage to Salary Soulon. Cyril is adamant that Lucien refused to attack on the portillon that he found too early. Cyril practically had to run him over with the car to get him going. When the Belgian finally went, it was to sit up 30 seconds ahead of the group, in the knowledge that Gitan Car wouldn't be allowed through. The gap had to be one minute. Cyril told the commissaire to inform the race director Godet that it was a minute. The comm refused to lie. Come on, bullied Cyril. The commissaire finally waved him through. Lucien still wouldn't listen. It was far too out. Desperate, Cyril urged the press car from Hetfolk to tell Lucien in Flemish that he needed to move or he'd lose the tour. That got him going. Lucien listened to his own people. So far, we have Puppet Master Cyril's version. Lucien remembers differently. Sure, the portillon was far out, but he came prepared. 30 kilometres before the call, teammate René Dillon had fetched the bottle of a special concoction Lucien would always have before a big climb. A mix of rice, oats, raisins and baby food. By the time they hit Portillon, Lucien was raring to go. All he had to do was dance away. A spur-of-the-moment decision. No mention of Cyril, the barrage or any press car in his memoirs, Lucien. He got into the flow on the pay resort, catching breakaway leader Ocania. Lucien let the struggling Super Sail leader crest first. Would he work with him? OK, but Ocania wanted the stage. A deal was made between the team cars. The Spaniard later received 50,000 francs. Zotamelk lost over three minutes, but Ocania couldn't keep up with Lucien in the hairpins to the salary. Although Lucien had the tour wrapped, he wasn't out of purgatory. Lucien couldn't bear the Belgian winning on his own initiative. The mule needed a lesson. Cyril's revenge came during stage 15 to Poe. When Dylan dropped back for Lucien's special concoction, Cyril refused to give it. He knew the last thing his leader wanted was to leave his position at the front, but he had no choice. Cyril smiled to himself when he watched Lucien drop back. That's it, come to daddy. Lucien asked and Cyril said no, too early. He loved making the Belgian beg. Lucien wanted to punch him. He was in yellow mid-race and his DS was refusing to give him a bottle. He sprinted back to the front, but not without telling Cyril he was an idiot. The Frenchman's plan had worked to perfection. Lucien had taken the bait. Cyril was going to make that small-minded Belgian crawl. After the stage, he declared that Lucien's behaviour was unacceptable. If he didn't apologise, the team would stop working for him. Zotamelk could have the tour. Lucien couldn't believe the madness. It took his wife Rita to convince him to say sorry. He couldn't let the psycho spoil his tour. To this day, Cyril claims, proudly, that he would have put his leader out of the race, yellow jersey or not. 44 years on, Lucien van Impe remains the last Belgian tour winner. 1995, A Tour of Becoming, by Olivia Caffoli. That summer I was 17. I wasn't racing anymore. The year before I had totally messed up at the Junior National Championships, after having forced my mum and brother to road trip across America from Denver to wherever that race was, so I could finally win a Stars and Stripes jersey. Well, that didn't happen. And as a funny aside, checking the USA Cycling Archive of winners in my age group during those years, I learned I was getting my ass kicked by Katie Compton, which somehow makes me feel much better about it all these years later. At least I was humiliated by the best. Back in those days, it was hard to see cycling coverage on TV in America. 
and frankly, I can't remember where I was watching the tour. Did ESPN show it? Can't imagine there was daily coverage on one of the big three network stations like there is these days, even if American coverage can never quite stop treating cycling like it does football or baseball. Nevertheless, I remember watching daily images of the 1995 tour. At first I was just passing time, enjoying the scenery, but as the days went on I started to get more and more wrapped up in proceedings. So many of the moments from that tour have stuck in my head as defining in many ways my love of the sport and dread of the worst that can happen as a result of it. It was a classic route, a prologue that ended up being wet and slippery, causing British hotshot Chris Boardman to come a cropper on a fast corner, crashing out of the race. Then there was a succession of flat stages leading into the first time trial, which Miguel Indurain handily won. A surprising performance went completely unnoticed by me. All well and good so far, and mostly stuff I had forgotten till I recently re-watched the video on YouTube. It wasn't until the race got to the Alps that I really became interested in what was happening. In the first mountain stage, someone I had never heard of rode breakaway companions off his wheel, and for a while was the yellow jersey on the road. Alex Zula was a blonde Swiss kid with a nice profile and classy riding style. Though I had always liked Indurain, I found myself rooting for Zula to do the impossible and push the king from his throne. Of course, that didn't happen. Zula won the stage into La Plana with two minutes in hand, but the Spaniard was second and still in yellow. Wearing the pink jersey of once, he doggedly hung on to Indurain over the rest of the Alps, through the massive Central and the Pyrenees. It was the first time I could remember somebody getting anywhere close to Indurain. I was impressed. So I became a fan of Zula. Since typically riders stop doing well once I've become a fan, I've always felt a little guilty about that. He probably would have had a far more illustrious career if I had missed that first Alpine stage. But he was good looking, talented and from Switzerland. That last point seems particularly poignant to me now. As an American with the usual mutt heritage, a heap of German, a dose of Spain and a dash of Portugal and who knows what else, I oddly always had a special feeling for the country and I never knew why. Maybe it was because my mum went there when I was in utero. Maybe it was a natural kinship of people who come from mountainous regions. But watching races in Switzerland, I would always feel a little pang of homesickness without knowing why. Then, as chance would have it, I ended up moving to Switzerland in my mid-thirties. And I have felt more at home here than any place since I was a teenager, sitting in my mum's back room watching the tour and my Swiss hero. We can't talk about the 1995 tour without also acknowledging the tragedy of Fabio Cassatelli's death on the Porte d'Aspe. One of those things you never think will happen, and then when it does, you wonder how it doesn't happen more often. In my years working in cycling, I have been with two teams that have suffered the tragic loss of a rider. It changes everything and everyone. There is an inevitable diminishment of joy and the stark reality of danger comes into greater focus. For a while. Then we all start getting back to work, back on the bike, back on the road. What else can we do? 2003, The Conversion by Andy McGrath. Do you remember the first tour? That initial one that gives you an ardour bordering on the religious? I certainly do. If it's a Damascene moment, I was a willing convert. A 14-year-old with nothing better to do that summer. By the end of the month, forget PlayStation or kicking a football around. I wanted a road bike and a Fasa Bortolo jersey. I've still got a dog-eared copy of Cycle Sport, in which I noted the results daily, and VHS videos of race recordings in my childhood bedroom. I got through a lot of tape. From the moment David Miller dropped his chain in the Paris prologue and lost by a fraction of a second, there was daily drama, or so I thought. In the fog of teenage love, you often exaggerate how good things were. With hindsight, the first week was soporific. Alessandro Pataki won four of the first five road stages and the only consequential event was the almighty pile-up on day two. Tyler Hamilton broke his collarbone and Jimmy Casper briefly became the people's hero, valiantly battling on with a bulbous brace round his neck. Once in the mountains, several contenders breathed fresh possibility and intrigue into the race after years of formulaic Armstrong dominance. 
Ivan Mayo and Alexander Vinokurov put time into the Texan on successive alpine days, threatening to be dangers. Josipa Baloki looked poised to challenge before his career-changing crash mid-race, his screams of pain picked up by the TV cameras. On his wheel, Armstrong was forced to take evasive action through a field. His previously white-knuckled stranglehold seemed looser than ever. The man who made the race a classic was Jan Ulrich on the comeback trail after losing a season to a knee injury and an amphetamine ban. Despite a chaotic lead-up with the Bianchi team assembled months before the race, he seemed to be getting better as the three weeks went on. The high point was the long-stage 12-time trial on a scorching day in France's southwest. Armstrong's mouth gaped open like a fish out of water, white salt deposits around his mouth as he lost 96 seconds to Ulrich. He looked vulnerable. That performance electrified the races last week. As the Pyrenees wore on, Ulrich and Vinokurov chipped away till they were both within 18 seconds of the yellow jersey. Armstrong was falling. Until he rose again. The defining image and moment of the race was his crash uphill on the Pyrenean climb of Luzard de Den, when a fan's musette snagged his brake lever, sending him crashing to the floor. For years, Armstrong had always seemed not just stronger, but luckier than everyone else on the tour. Well, not that summer. He caught up and rode everyone off his wheel again, all square-jawed defiance and burning intensity. Had it been a cartoon, steam would have been billowing out of his ears. Winning ugly is still winning. Though his eventual 61-second margin was the narrowest since 1989. Even unexpected transition stages fizzed, with memorable images like Tyler Hamilton's day-long breakaway in the Pyrenees, and Juan Antonio Fletcher's arrow-firing victory salute, probably the coolest I can recall. The race even went down to the wire in Paris with the closest ever green jersey battle, decided by two points in a matter of centimetres between fellow Australians Baden Cook and Robbie McEwen. It was one of the last years when the peloton was a vivid sea of colours, with Bianchi Celeste and Ouskata's fluorescent orange capturing the imagination. The 2003 race appeared a little more human. Riders went up the last climbs without helmets, many without their sunglasses too. I was so naive. The list of protagonists now reads like a doping rogues gallery. Armstrong, Ulrich, Hamilton, Vinokurov, Pataki and so on. But it didn't diminish the impact of that tour on me and the excitement I felt at the time. Even allowing for a rose tint of nostalgia, I still believe the 2003 tour is the most enthralling edition of this century. And I don't mind if it never gets any better than that, because that one set me up for life. 1948. Tour, not war. By Isabel Best. The greatest tour de France ever. Does it even warrant a discussion? It can only be the 1948 edition. A race so perfect and so miraculous, it's surprising the Vatican didn't make a Catholic propaganda movie out of it, starring Gino the Pious, living embodiment of muscular Christianity. 1948 marked the second tour to follow World War II, but the first post-war edition in which the Italians took part. At their helm stood Gino Bartoli, with his fine Roman senator's nose, looking like he'd stepped straight out of central casting for a Hollywood epic. He was 34, an age at which most riders bid their adieus, and had already won everything that mattered, as far as the Italians are concerned, including a dominant Tour de France ten years prior. He had so many Giro d'Italias, Milan San Remos and Giro de Lombardias to his name, you would never know he'd lost his racing prime to the war. Back home he was revered. Schoolchildren would rush out and kiss the road when Bartoli went by on his bike, recalls the French rider Raphael Geminiani, I saw it myself. I thought, this can't be real. Many assumed Bartoli's participation in 1948 was a farewell gesture of sorts, a nostalgic long goodbye from an emperor visiting one of his colonies. That's certainly how things panned out at the start. Despite winning the first stage in a sprint, Bartoli rapidly lost time to a new generation of unknown hotshots. One of them was a 23-year-old Breton rider, Louis Bobet who took the race lead on stage six and held on to it for eight days. 
Bartoli rallied by winning the stage into Lourdes. He made the entire peloton attend mass at the Virgin Shrine, then won the next day's stage into Toulouse. Though these blessings were no doubt gratefully received, Bartoli's GC position needed actual miracles. By the time the peloton reached Cannes, he was 20 minutes behind Bobet. During the rest day that followed, he considered abandoning. Most of the Italian press had already packed their bags and left. And then, a crisis of an entirely different sort. A fascist sympathiser tried to assassinate the leader of the Italian Communist Party. As Palmiro Togliatti hovered between life and death in hospital, the country's largest union called a general strike. There were fears things could escalate into civil war. Late that night, Bartoli received a call from the Italian Prime Minister, begging him to distract everyone by winning a stage at the tour. Bartoli considered the request for a moment, and then replied that he could do better than that. He would win the whole thing. The following day, he took the first of three consecutive mountain stages, a feat never since equalled, in freezing rain, mud, fog and snow. Sailing away from his adversaries on the Izoa, Bartoli reduced his deficit to Bobet to just over a minute. It took a day of apocalypse such as this to reveal the supreme quality of this Italian champion, wrote Jacques Godet, the race director. The next day, he went head-to-head with Bobet through the mud of the Quad Affair, finally distancing him by seven minutes in the fog on the Col de Port. The third stage featured a nasty climb up a gravelly goat track of a road over La Forcla in Switzerland. Half the peloton was reduced to walking. Bartoli finished the day in yellow with nearly 14 minutes on Bobet. Back in Italy, there were chaotic scenes in Parliament, as politicians went from almost trading blows to slapping each other's back in jubilation. Crisis was averted. Bartoli ploughed on, winning the 19th stage, featuring 249 kilometres across the Ardennes, his seventh victory in that year's race. The Italian, like all great heroes, was imperfect. He had his airs and graces, recalls Geminiani, who had been part of that generation of young guns in 1948. You had to open doors for him and bring him his chair. He was sometimes described as cold and difficult, but Geminiani, who revered him, remembers him as very gentil, meaning both good and kind. He loved those who could pit themselves against him. He had a profound admiration for his adversaries. Everything about the 1948 tour is the stuff of legend. 17 of the 21 stages were well over 200 kilometres long, on roads that had fallen into disrepair during the war. The hotels were so basic, an entire team of 10 riders would share one bath. The food, supplied by the race organisers, was often putrid. There was no such thing as getting fresh water or snacks from the team car. On most stages, the race organisers eliminated the day's Lantern Rouge. As a result of all of this, of the 120 riders who set out, only 44 made it back. I know what you're thinking. The racing must have been a slow post-war funeral dirge like in 1919. Not so. In fact, Bartoli's average speed that year set a new record. 25 years later, with surfaced roads, better bikes and a final peloton twice the size, Luis Ocaña's victory was marginally slower. 2007, Richard Abraham, Bittersweet Symphony. The 2007 tour was a catastrophe. Let's get that out of the way now. But there was a fleeting moment of brilliance in that year's race that I will never forget. In the final week, in what looked like to be a stage-winning break, Sandy Kassar hit a wayward dog and came down. He gingerly scraped himself up off the tarmac, rejoined the escape and promptly attacked on the bend just before the central reservation appeared in the road, ensuring that nobody could catch his wheel. Kazar got reeled back in but won the false flat sprint anyway, a massive kiss my shredded derriere to his breakaway companions. The moment had it all. The heat shimmer of high summer beamed through the screen, the colour, panache, bravery, cunning, human endurance and cheek, quite literally. In short, everything that's great about the tour. We spent a lot of time watching that race. 2007 was the wettest British summer on record, and we had to grab those moments when they came. As rivers burst their banks, it felt like the year without a summer when Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. 
We watched a new horror story unfold in hourly instalments every evening with Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin. Was there a palpable sense then that cycling had hit rock bottom by this point? Had that happened in 2006 or 1998? Could we actually say that this was as bad as it could get? Whatever. The sport was on the abyssal plain, sunk into the microplastic and rotting whales and enthusiastically slurping up the ooze. Racers were curiously trying to do winning the tour without wholeheartedly wanting to be winner of the tour. Floyd Landis had been scrubbed off the honours board and Oscar Pereiro was defending champion without being champion. Jan Ulrich had retired, even Barso had fessed up, and Spanish investigators were gamely figuring out name tags as they sorted out Dr Fuentes' clinical store cupboard of lost property. Hopes were not high for the race. There was either blind optimism, Levi Leipheimer is a favourite to win the clean tour, or abject despair. Eeyore on Windows XP kind of stuff. Apparently most fans wanted to see the tour suspended until somebody could clean it up. But the race staggered on. It got messy, it got complicated. Remember, this was pre-credit crunch, pre-austerity, pre-Brexit, pre-Trump, pre-Covid. This tour was way ahead of the curve. I'm not going to say that this sort of stuff didn't make life miserable for a lot of people, because it did, and it still does. But let's not forget, too, that it produced one hell of a spectacle. The result was the second closest Tour de France in history. Contador beat Cadell Evans by 23 seconds. This was the 1989 Tour, but for millennials. The reality was fucked up and the future looked bleak, but let's try and have some fun, shall we? Think of all the other good stuff. There was the London Grand Depart at a time when cycling was still niche and still cool. Rouleur was barely a year old. And the only stuffed mammals in London were in the Natural History Museum. There was a wannabe romantic poet, David Miller's poignant breakaway yomp in the English countryside a day later. There was Fabian Cancellara out sprinting the sprinters in Copienia with a lead out for himself. Then there was Bradley Wiggins and his futile lone move on stage seven, a perfect symbol of how Brits were still very much the underdogs at the tour. AG2R rode gold Campagnolo chamals. What's not to like? And admit it, we got a kick out of all that bad stuff too. Whether Michael Rasmussen had been taking vast quantities of performance-enhancing drugs in Mexico or Italy was pure murder mystery. Wrongly reporting whereabouts is a flagrant violation of UCI rules and is unacceptable, said his Rabobank team when they sacked him, forgetting that although Al Capone went down for tax evasion, he's still remembered mainly for the massacres. Not long before that, it turned out that the blood pouring out of Alexander Vinokurov's weak old wounds during his miraculous mid-race time trial win was not his own, so Astana had gone home too. The tour had become just another crime drama on ITV4, dead and buried in the televisual graveyard. But it was resurrected. The race now is generally cleaner and doesn't ruin people's lives quite as much. It's not perfect, but it is better. And deep down in 2007, there's a pretty good lesson there too. Enjoy the good stuff wherever you find it. Is it the best tour? No way. Greatest tour? (laughs) Doesn't come close. Favourite tour? Afraid so. 1953. A Fruitful Dinner by Paul Maunder. Regardless of how long and complex the Tour de France is, we remember only the briefest moments. Even more so as the race in question passes beyond living memory. Ah, we say, that was the year that Gaul attacked in the rain, that Delgado turned up late for the prologue. The 1953 Tour de France is remembered for Louis Sombobé's solo attack on the Col d'Isoire and the VIP spectator who cheered him on. Fasto Coffee stood roadside, cheering on and taking photos of the passing riders. But it was another moment, behind the scenes, that really sealed Bobé's triumph. And that moment says a great deal about professional bike racing, about its substance. In the spring of 1953, The French public and press were agitated about the lack of recent success at their home race. Jean Robic, the hobgoblin of Brittany himself, had won the 1947 edition, the first after the war. 
but the following five editions had been claimed by Italian and Swiss riders. Coppi's 1952 victory was so dominant that the tour director Jacques Godet changed the route for the following year to try and make it more interesting. Coppi, who won the Giro that May, elected not to ride, though his reasons were a mystery. French team managers were under pressure to bring a strong team, so there was consternation when they picked Louis Bobet as leader. Bobet had ridden the Tour five times and, despite showing flashes of brilliance, had never looked a serious contender. Moreover, he had failed to finish the 1953 Giro, so his form was questionable. Confidence in him as a leader was so low that teammate Raphael Gemignani publicly questioned Bobet's ability. When the Tour began in Strasbourg, it was Swiss sprinter Fritz Scher who took the glory, winning the opening two stages. In the Pyrenees, Robic took the Luchon stage and the Maillot Jaune. The Breton was so light that he struggled to keep up on descents, so for this stage he had a soigneur hand him a bottle full of lead at the top of the final climb. Robic lost the jersey the following day, but it stayed with his team. As first François Mahé, then Jean Malejac took over. But while France West enjoyed themselves in yellow, Bobet and his teammates were falling out. Bobet was known to be a sensitive, brittle character. His confidence seemed to hang by a thread. After his teammate Nello Lorede outsprinted him in Béziers, denying Bobet what would have been a useful time bonus, the team captain lost his cool. At dinner that night, he accused Lorede and Gemignani of leading a conspiracy against him. The argument was resolved when someone in the team with an eye for an opportunity proposed a solution. Bobet would split all his prize money with the team and in return they would help him win the tour. On the now legendary gap to Briançon stage, the team protected Bobet until the right moment, then he went on the attack on the Col d'Isoire. Tour mythology describes the moment the 28-year-old, alone in the lead on the baking slopes of the Casse des Airs, looked up to see Fausto Coppi cheering him on, his lover Julia Locatelli beside him. Bobet grinned and called out his thanks. A beautiful image, one for the ages but not the moment the race was won. 2019, A Race for the Ages, by Ian Cleverly. Everything was so much better back in the day, wasn't it? Real racing. No radios, no helmets, men were men. Copy, Anquetil, Merckx and Eno were legends of the tour, the likes of which we will never see again. Plus, there was no Team Sky to strangle the living daylights out of the race and produce a bore of a tour. Hogwash. The 2019 edition produced more drama than Shakespeare, more twists and turns than A Descent of the Galibier, and more exciting performances than A Night at the Oscars. To set the scene... Sky left the sport, but Ineos stepped into Brailsford's breach to maintain his team's position as the best funded in cycling. But with Chris Froome out injured, defending champion Geraint Thomas in questionable form and young prospect Egan Bernal lacking experience and maturity, they were far from a shoe in for once. It was a golden opportunity for the French, winless at their home tour for 34 years. Romain Bardet and Thibaut Pinot were prime candidates, not without their flaws, but certainly in the running. Other than that, the race was wide open, with poor form in the run-up making for a few other likely challengers. Also, we thought. The glorious Julian Alaphilippe took the bull by the horns with a superb solo win on stage three to take yellow. Small beer, you'd think. A mere aperitif. But leaving the Massif Centrale, it was Alaphilippe heading the GC table, having lost, then regained the lead via a savvy attacking display with his compatriot Pino now sitting in third. In short, Pino cracked. Thomas and Bernal clawed their way back up the standings, Stephen Kreisweig loitered with intent, while Alaphilippe produced the ride of his life to take the time trial in Po. As for what might have happened in the now infamous stage 19, we'll never know. The race was cut short due to a landslide on the descent of the Isara. With 38 kilometres remaining at the race's abandonment, you have to ask if Alaphilippe could possibly have got down off that mountain in another risk it all jaw dropping descent that pushed his abilities and the grip of his tyres to the absolute limits. 
Could the Frenchman have limited his losses sufficiently to overturn what was now a 48-second lead for Egan Bernal? The following day, another truncated stage of a mere 59 kilometres provided the definitive answer. This man who seemingly loved every second of his Tour de France could give no more. The singing, dancing, drumming man from Loire shipped more time and slipped off the podium. It is said nobody remembers who finishes second. On this occasion, it was Geraint Thomas. The defending champion put on a brave display for unity, while his teammate Bernal, all smiles and holding hands across the finish line, whilst inwardly seething at his inability to turn the tables on the young pretender. But I'd wager many readers remember who finished fifth in Paris. Julian Alaphilippe lit up the race. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Enrique Mas was nominated GC Man for Desinink, with Elia Viviani for the sprints. Anything else was a bonus. Had Alaphilippe pulled it off, it would have been the mugging of the century. Never mind the first French tour win for decades. Ineos, Movistar, Jumbo, UAE. Your boys took one hell of a beating. It was not to be. And there was so much more to celebrate anyway. Colombia's first winner, the youngest for over a century, Caleb Ewan finally making his tour debut and rewarding Lotto Saudel with three stage wins. Movistar and their absurd three-pronged GC strategy predictably ending in tears. Perhaps celebrate is the wrong word here. The 2019 edition was the finest in my 35 years of tour watching history. For drama, great racing and unpredictability, it will take some race to top it. Name me a better one. I'll wait. You've been listening to The Magnificent Seven by Ruler Contributors, read by Hannah Braxton-Brown and George Oliver from Ruler Issue 20.5.